In this section, we will discuss genotype phenotype discordance. So when we talk about autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant, or X-linked recessive, those types of diseases, those single gene inherited diseases, sometimes what we see is we have a disease causing genotype that doesn't give the expected phenotype. There are several reasons why this might happen. We'll discuss these, the variable penetrance, variable expressivity, and mosaicism. A variable penetrance means that a certain fraction of individuals with a given genotype don't express the phenotype that's associated with that genotype. Several reasons why this may happen. Maybe because the effect of the mutated gene is expressed differently in different genetic backgrounds. There could be environmental factors that come into play here. Different things that might make it so that even though the individual has the genotype for the disease, phenotypically they don't express it. Now this may create confusing pedigrees if we look at a pedigree. If you look at the inheritance here, what would you expect? Here we see a dominant disease because it's in every generation, but we see one individual who we would assume to have the disease over there on the left, but that he doesn't have the disease. And so what we could say there uh, is that there's a chance that we have variable penetrance going on. Genotypically, he may have the right alleles in order to express that disease, but phenotypically, he doesn't have the characteristics. Another example of genotype-phenotype discordance is variable expressivity. This means that there is variability among individuals with a disease phenotype in either the severity of the disease or the spectrum of disease manifestations. A good example of a disease that has variable expressivity is Marfan syndrome. Remember, this is an autosomal dominant mutation in the fibrillin gene, so we have structural protein malformation. Now, the syndrome, we see st tall stature, we see kyphal scoliosis, eye abnormalities such as lens dislocation or retinal detachment, and cardiac abnormalities such as aortic dissection or mitral valve prolapse. A single individual with Marfan's may have one of these characteristics, a few of them, or all of them to varying degrees. So what we see here is that there is a specific genotype for the disease, but in the phenotype there's heterogeneity among individuals with the disease. So they all express the disease, but they express the disease to certain levels. So if they're expressing the disease in varying degrees, we call that variable expressivity. Mosaicism is another example of discordance in which there are two or more populations of cells in a single body or a single person with different genotypes. For example, one subset of cells may contain a disease-causing mutation while the rest of the cells are normal. And this can have variable effects on a population or an individual. What you may see with a mosaic disease is decreased severity. You may see tissue specificity, or you can see variable inheritance if gametes are mosaic. So with mosaicism, the mechanism you want to think embryologically, early somatic mutation in a certain subset of cells. So we see a zygote dividing, dividing, cells are normal, and then all of a sudden one of those cells becomes mutated, but the rest stay normal. So what happens is that cell lineage that comes out of that mutated cell will have the disease or the problem while all of the other cells are normal. So what would you see there? Mosaic, let's say it's in a, a cell line that's destined to become cardiac cells, and you would see a cardiac abnormality with all the rest being normal. Another example of mosaic mechanism is in the fusion of multiple zygotes. If you have one zygote that's normal, and another zygote that's developing with this mutation, and then instead of developing into two separate individuals, they fuse together early on, you can have mosaic individuals develop that way as well. Now, how do we explain the appearance of a new genetic disease in an individual with no apparent family history? Can we call it a discordance? Do we call it a new mutation? There's lots of things that need to be explained, or lots of possibilities that could explain, right? For example, inadequate family history. Perhaps we don't know enough of the background to decide, is this autosomal? Is it sex-linked? Is it dominant? What is it? What's going on? Uh, another thing could be a lack of penetrance in the parents. Maybe the parents have the genotype, but they don't express the disease. Could also be genetic mosaicism. Perhaps the disease is only expressed in the gametes, or the mutation is only expressed in the gametes. So there again, the patients wouldn't express, the, or the parents of the patient wouldn't express the disease. 
Uh, we could have a premutation event, this anticipation that we talked about earlier with triplet repeat expansions. Maybe there's anticipation here. Or it could always be a spontaneously arising new mutation. That's always something you have to consider. So lots of different possibilities to think about when you have a new mutation in a genetic disease. All right, let's try a practice question here. Uh, a husband and wife, ages 29 and 34 respectively, come to the office for advice regarding their risk of having hearing impaired children. They are both hearing impaired and require hearing aids. Their hearing loss is sensory neural and is not associated with any other health problems. The wife tells you, we have both learned to live with this disability, but we want to take it into account before we decide to have children. Their pedigree is shown with the patients identified as 2, 2, and 2, 3. So those Roman numerals indicate the generations. And then the standard numerals indicate the patient or the, the offspring. So 2, 2, and 2, 3, generation 2, individuals 2 and 3 there. So we look up in the pedigree and we can find those that they're talking about. Now, you advise them that A, accurate risk estimation is impossible without further evaluation. B, because they are hearing impaired, all their children will be hearing impaired. C, it is likely that they will have hearing impaired children. D, only their male children will be hearing impaired. Or E, they can have amniocentesis during pregnancy to test whether the infant will be hearing impaired. With these types of questions where you have to choose the best answer, the way to go about them is to do process of elimination. So let's just start at the top and we'll work our way through. A says accurate risk estimation is impossible without further evaluation. That's something we can't really decide for or against right now until we see what the other possibilities are. So we'll hold on to that one for now. B says because they are hearing impaired, all their children will be hearing impaired. Now looking at the pedigree, can you say that all of their children will be hearing impaired? Well, no, because we're looking at something that looks recessive since they both carry, maybe that's it, but it could be something else. It could be a sex linked. We don't know what's going on for sure. And so we can't say that all of the children will be hearing impaired, so we can eliminate that. C says it is unlikely that they will have hearing impaired children. Again, this is a genetic disease. They're both affected. So to say that it would be unlikely that they have affected children would also be false, and you can eliminate that one as well. D says only their male children will be hearing impaired. We see in the pedigree a mix of male and females, so it's not likely that they would only pass to males. So we can eliminate that one as well. E says they can have amniocentesis during pregnancy to test whether the infant will be hearing impaired. Now that's true, but does that answer your question? Remember, they're concerned about getting pregnant. Amniocentesis happens after you already are pregnant, so it doesn't do us any good to answer their question that way. So we can eliminate that and come to find out the correct answer choice here is A. Now let's look at a random pedigree here. If you look at this pattern, what type of inheritance would you say is happening? We see skipping of generations, so we want to say probably recessive, right? Who's being affected? Is it males, females, or both? It's males, right? And we see the males coming through, and we notice that the males that are getting it coming, are coming through maternal inheritance. So if you look at that third generation, it's their mom that's related and not the dad. Note that the dad that is related, that has the disease, doesn't have any offspring with the disease. So what kind of inheritance pattern are you looking at here? It's likely X-linked recessive, right? Passing from mother to son, mother to son. Here we have another question, random disease for you. The most common form of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is, which of the following? Is it autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-linked dominant, X-linked recessive, or mitochondrial? And the answer is A, autosomal dominant, right? This is a gain of function type of mutation or a dominant negative function with collagen getting in and gumming up the works. So you only need one bad copy, and therefore you would consider it an autosomal dominant disease. That concludes this section of the lecture. In the next section, we will discuss population genetics.